So chapter 1, D.A. spoke about the elect in sanctification for obedience, an inheritance incorruptible reserved for us. Chapter 2, Steve taught about, he asked, if we're willing to endure the shame of sharing our faith now so as to not to suffer the shame of having not shared our faith in eternity. Uh, chapter 3, D.A. reminded the ladies to be submitted to your husbands, whether they are obeying the word or not, winning them by your conduct, not your nagging. Men, he reminded us to dwell with our wives with understanding, honoring her so that our prayers would not be hindered. One of the key things that I want to, that we're going to, is going to be a theme through this that D.A. brought up last week is the idea that God, God calls us to change our mind on things in this verse, in this chapter a lot. But he changes the hearts. It's, it's, it can be easy to look in, into this scripture and get an idea of us having to grunt out our salvation, um, acting like Christians. And that's not what this is about. It's God's asking us to change our hearts and our minds. Excuse me, asking us to change our minds to be in alignment with him and his scripture. He does the, he does the heart work so that we want to do that, that we're able to do that. He does the empowering of that. So let's read 1 Peter chapter 4. Oh, is that the right chapter? Just kidding. It's a joke. It's a joke. <laughs> Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it strange. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. Love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in, any, in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your instruction. Uh, I pray, God, for each of us in here, Lord, that you would, you would teach us, Lord, that you would illuminate your scriptures to us, God, that we would be changed, that we 
would not take these and, and use them as, a, as any type of sword or weapon towards others. But, God, that we would use them, God, to, uh, to grow in you and, and be strengthened in you. God, I just thank you for your grace. I thank you, God, that you are a God of mercy. I thank you, God, that you take no joy in our suffering. But, Lord, in it, you are glorified. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. Therefore, what do we do when we see a therefore? Why is it therefore? All right. So go back up to 318. You kind of get the, the gist for Christ also suffered once for sins for the just the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God and there's obviously more to that we're not going to go over that right now that's kind of the the context of where we're coming into that Christ suffered he was just we are not and yet he he suffered for us sacrificed for us who were unjust and so here we are therefore Christ suffered for us in the flesh Arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he has suffered in, he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. In First Peter chapter one, we have this concept of gird your mind, right? And in chapter four here we have this concept of arm your mind. Now those are actually both unique words within the Greek te- text. Neither word is used ever again before or after in the text. And the idea of the, the girding is kind of a setting your mind, getting it ready, getting it, th- getting it in the right place that we live in a, a world and there's going to be a, a, a fallen world and there's going to be work required. It's not just easy peasy living. We're not, we're not, we're not living life and we're, we're, we're going against the flow. When, when we as believers, when you put your faith in Christ, we're no longer going the same direction as this world. There's going, just like you step into a river, there's going to be some, there's some pushback. Even if there's not any specific direct attack on you, there's just going to be kind of a resistance to doing anything good because we're going a different direction. We are doing a different thing than the world is doing. And so that's kind of the idea of gird up your, the loins of your mind is trying to get your mind right on that matter. And then we get here to arm your mind, arm yourself also with the same mind. And the idea of that is, is that you are, you're going from a more of a passive getting your mind ready to an action, an intention, I'm now going into battle. And the best analogy I can kind of come up with this for myself and my own life that, I, that I've kind of uh, dealt with is that, is that um, when I was in the military, and I want to be careful here, I'm not painting some picture, I was a computer programmer. I'm not exactly hardcore, right? So <laughs> let's be clear on that. I was a computer programmer. So, but I was in the military. <laughs> so when I, when I was deployed to Bosnia, um, there was a period that I, we got the call, I'm going, and there's a period of preparation. And my mind is set, I'm going to Bosnia, there's the, this, is, this is happening, right? And so I get, you know, all the preparations that need to happen, get my bills taken care of, do, you know, all those t- type of things that you need to do that I'm going to be gone for a while, and I, my mind is set for it. That preparation continued to happen on the plane over, on landing, on you know, we get there for the first time and, uh, to, the, to the base where I'm staying. And all that is kind of a mental, inactive, passive preparation, right? I'm going into a, a dangerous place. In my mind, as a 21-year-old, I thought it was dangerous. But, you know, I'm, I'm going there. I'm not going there into battle. I'm going there to change hard drives and stuff like that. So <laughs> how dangerous is it? But anyway, as a 21-year-old, it was a big deal. So um, I'm going there, and it's not until we're leaving the base for the first time in an arm- armored Humvee, strapped down with weapons, heading to another base to swap a hard drive, but heading to another, va- another base, that it becomes really real at that point, and it becomes an intentional, the, 
the kind of foggy thinking of, yeah, there's a, we're in a war here, all of, a, all of a sudden became very crystal clear. Oh, I'm walking out into it, right? I mean, here we're, stra- we're strapped and ready to go. Now, again, I don't want to paint a picture that's not, not there. That was about the first three times until I figured out that it's really not much going on there. And so it, it, it became a, an obvious thing of... Um, there's not a lot of danger here. So that alert level kind of dropped. And that, that, that's kind of a warning to us in, our, in, in, the, in where we live right now in the West, where things are so easy, is that, that that wartime mentality where you are ready and you're, you're on high alert against spiritual attacks, eh, it's not so bad around here. We're not under persecution. We're not suffering. It's, it's easy to slip into the, the, the lazy Christian the not really pouring ourselves out spiritually, not really actively serving the Lord. It's easy to fall into that when we're not suffering per- persecution. And that's, that's a, a, something we'll, a theme we'll kind of see through here is that, is that suffering clarifies, suffering purifies us. It takes so it, the, the, the things that we fall into, the things that we're tempted by all of a sudden fall away when, we're, when we are starting to suffer. So what mind? Okay, talk, talking about what mind. Um, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has also ceased from sin. So what mind are we talking about? Ready to suffer in the flesh for the sake of others. To cease from sin, no longer living for your lusts. To live for the will of God. All of those things we're supposed to arm our minds with that idea that we are to sacrifice. That, that idea of suffering is, is, a, is a choice to sacrifice. A lot of people want a victory. They want things to go well for them. They want, you know, whether it's in work life, whether it's, you know, hitting the gym. You know, they, they have this idea, I want to get fit and in shape, but they hit snooze constantly. I'm Right? They don't actually get up and go to the gym. They just want to be in shape. They want, they want the victory without the sacrifice, right? And so that's, that's a reality. That's obviously a reality I deal with is, it, is we can easily decide, man, I've got my mind set on what I want, but I don't have my mind set on the action of choosing to sacrifice what needs to be sacrificed in order to achieve what I want, what I think I want, what I think God wants me to do. So Christians, I encourage you uh, to recognize that you're in a, in a battle. Like I was talking about, it's very easy to, to be in the mindset here in the West of not recognizing that we're in a battle. We are in a battle. There are people in your families around you that are being lost in this spiritual battle. There's casualties of this war. And we need to be recognizing that we're in this battle and so that we have the right mind so that we can be fighting for those around us. This idea of for the sake of others. We sacrifice, we're saved, right? We put our faith in Christ, we're saved. But we sacrifice so that others can be saved, so that we can share the gospel with others, so that others might find out. And that, and that becomes right now, like Steve was talking about, that's just kind of a shame thing right now. It's, we just feel a little bit of shame in places like China, in places like North Korea, that's a real sacrifice. You could die for sharing your faith. And that's, that's a real thing. And so it's a, it's a choice. I, I want this person, God has put this person on my heart to share that gospel with, to share the message of, of grace with. And it's, it may take something from me. It could even end up in my life being gone. Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after, after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Sacrificial. Matthew 5, 29 through 30, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. And cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than your whole body be cast into hell. What are those things 
The, the idea is not necessarily plucking out your eye. That's kind of hyperbole. Though it's true. Would you rather have one eye than go, go to hell? But the idea is what are those things that are in your life, that are in my life, that are holding me back from fully walking out Christ? Is it the phone? It's certainly a problem in my life. That, that, this, that phone can be a time waster. It can be an attention grabber of the things. I wake up in the morning, Lord, I want to do these things for you. Mm. That's, a, that's a reality, and I'm probably not the only one that, that loses portions of my life to that stupid device. And we need to be careful. Are we, what are we going to do? Are we going to set it aside? Are we going to set it aside? And I'm, I'm just being frank with you guys. There's, there are times I set it aside. And then I walk back over there and I pick it back up. Oh, I'm not, you, not bringing this to bed this time. I walk back over there, pick it up. Just checking it, right? So it's, it is a, just being <laughs> transparent with you guys. It's, it's not, a, I don't have this struggle sorted out. And that's just one example. There's many other examples of things that we waste our time and effort and energy and attention on that we ought not do. So arm yourself with this mind. You're at war against your flesh. You're at war against the world to be a witness to those who see you as an enemy. Many people will see us as enemies and we're here to be a witness to them. That takes sacrifice. As, as I mentioned earlier, DA brought up last week, change your mind and God will change your heart. And I'm gonna encourage you guys to embrace the battle. Embrace the battle. Let's go to verse 2. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the, in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Um, so I'm going to embarrass Steve probably here. Um, so Steve is very disciplined, and I'm sure he's got areas in his life he knows, he knows that, or not, but, I, but he, to me, is like, you know, somebody I look up to, right? And so um, he makes these choices from a, from a physical, from a spiritual perspective. He chooses those things, and I see that he, at his age, is very physically fit, Right? And <laughs> but that's a that's a that's a sacrificial choice that he makes with the eating that he does, with the working out this. And I'm not exalting Steve. What I'm what I'm and I like I said, Steve's got his own stuff. I'm sure he he knows in his heart his stuff, right? I'm I am strong in some areas. There's other areas that I'm not strong in, right? <laughs> So that's just being real. There, there's, so, so we have our different strengths and weaknesses. And so I'm, but I'm encouraging you. And the point being here is that there is a, when, when we're talking about outward physical uh, taking care of your body, we have an example in, my, in our brother here of a choice to sacrifice, to, to eat well, to do the things. And that's an example for us on the spiritual side. It, it takes a daily choice. It takes a daily sacrifice and to actually walking through that choice, not just, I'm going to do this tomorrow. I don't know how many first days I've had of diets, right? I'm going to do this tomorrow. No, man, we got to just that one day, that one day, that one day, and making that choice each day. And it's it's important on a physical level. I'm not saying the Bible says, you know, there, there is some importance to taking care of your body, but it's not nearly as important on, on the spiritual side. Do we, are we doing that daily, that daily choice to chase after our father or that daily choice to spend some time with him? He's not, we don't really have to chase. He's there. We have to run away from the stuff that keeps us from going, right? That's really what we need to do. That went totally off my notes. Um, <laughs> 
Romans, 5, Romans 8, 5 through 7. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So I'm one, again, I want to be very clear here. I'm not talking about grunting out the Christian walk in your flesh. Romans 8, 8. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. It doesn't matter what our external appearance looks like if people think we look Christian-y. Like we got it, we we're putting together this good picture for, for people to see. That doesn't, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. It matters that we're, we're, we're authentically uh, pouring out our lives for Christ. We're, we're, uh, we're open and, and, uh, and uh, vulnerable to the king, that he's, that he's able to have that relationship with us. We're able to know him. That's what matters. It doesn't matter the, the external appearance. So I don't, so the spiritual denial, the spiritual sacrifice, again, is not a thing in the flesh. It's, a, it's a, an opportunity to sacrifice for our king that we can have that connection with him, that we can grow in that relationship with him, that, we, that he then gives us the strength. We set our mind to, I'm going to do this thing. God, help me do this thing. I'm going to do this thing. God, help me do this thing. The beginning of that verse starts with that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh. And so our mindset should be, Father, help me. I no longer want to be that person. I no longer want to be that person. You're going to still have that temptation to be that person, to walk in that flesh, to, to respond in a certain way. But when you have that temptation, Father, I no longer want to be that person. Father, help me. I no longer want to do those things that hurt me and others. You know we each have something in us that we, often our tongue, that we like to cut people or we like to do things, say things that, that are hurtful. They damage our relationships, so they wind up hurting us, but they also damage those that we love because we're, we're saying mean things, we're doing mean things. Father, help me. I no longer want to do those things that hurt me and others. And Father, help me. I no longer want to serve my will. That's the choosing, I'm going to change my mind. That's the mental, God, I don't want to do this thing. And the recognition, I can't do it without him. Father, help me. I don't want to do this thing. And that's what we call, that's the idea of biblical repentance. That's what repentance is. It's, it's that changing of your mind. It's like, I was going this way, and this is what I thought, but God says it's sin, so I'm going to go this way. God says it's sin, and I'm going to align my mind with what God says. I may not agree with it as a human being yet. I may, like, I may not feel that in my heart yet. I mean, like, well, I, I don't necessarily agree, but I recognize God says that's sin, so God, I'm going to trust you that that's sin God, I don't want to do sin. I want to follow you. Whatever that label the sin is, God says that's wrong. So I'm going to change my mind. I don't feel it yet, but I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to, do, I'm going to change my mind from that and let him change my heart. Eventually, he'll come around and he'll change what you want if you're willing to change your mind on the matter. Verse 3. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, rivalries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Psalms 90, 12. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. When I, when I was reading this, verse and thinking through it, it kind of, it brought to me, um, brought to my mind that scene in Lord of the Rings where, I don't remember, the, the big beast in the cave, I forget what it is, and Gandalf is, Gandalf runs across the bridge, 
hits the staff this far and no further. And that's kind of the, the picture that I get in this is that this is, this is enough. This is enough. I don't want this junk in my life anymore. And that's where we got to get our mind to. I don't, this is enough. I don't want that. I don't want that, God. It's, it's again a mind setting. Father, help me. I've had enough with being that person. Father, help me. I've had enough of doing those things that hurt me and other people. Father, help me. I have had enough of serving my will. No longer I've had enough. In regard to these, verse 4, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. Here's the reality is that when you get saved, when you or you start wanting to be serious about your faith and following Christ, there are those that you ran with, or those that are your friends, that they're going to look at you and speak evil of you because you no longer want to do the things they were doing. Want, you were doing it last week, now you're not doing it this week. Oh, you think you're better than us? And that's even if you are not intentionally judging them in any way, they're going to feel that judgment and they're going to speak evil. And so we got to be careful. We, you know, there, there's a reality of that, and we need to be aware of that. Again, we need to be embracing the battle. We need to be wise as Christians, understanding we are in a spiritual battle. That's going to come. The world's going to speak evil of us. That's going to come. You can't watch many movies or TVs any, or TV shows anymore where Christians aren't made fun of. That's going to come. That's not going to get better. That's just going to come. And that's okay. Don't act like, oh, what's going on here? That's expected. That's expected. Verse 5 and 6. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to the men in the flesh, but live according to the men in the spirit. This is why it talks about they will give an account. So your friend, these, these people that judge you will give an account for that, that judge us will give an account for that. That should not be a, yeah, they're going to give an account for that. Yeah, that should be a, oof. I, need, I need to go share the gospel with them. I need to pray for them. That should be a call to arms, a call to action, not a, mm-hmm thumb your nose at them like ha ah, that's not what this is about it's a it's a call to action and that's that's the you know my mom it, I go eat with my parents on uh, on Fridays and we sometimes are in there solving all the world's problems in politics not at all and that's you know my, my mom has you know really been the Lord has worked on her and she's frustrated with what's going on in DC and it's like no God said he, he loves them Right? And that's a, that's a huge thing. God, God, our heart should be, we love them. As, as much as they, you know, call us evil, that's, that's what our heart should be towards them. And that's, that's difficult. That's sacrifice. That is, I'm, I'm t- lowering my pride. I'm laying it down so that I can love them, period. And then we get to six there. So for this reason, the gospel is preached also to those who were dead. Remember, we were dead once. The gospel was preached to us when we were dead. And the same applies to them. It's, it should be preached to them. We shouldn't be mad at them. It's, it's to be preached to them so that they can live according to the Spirit. And they may not respond. That part's not up to us. It's, it's our part to share. It's our part to love. It's our part to pray. It's our part to, to sacrifice if need be. But we can't force them to change. We can't force them to accept that's between them and the Lord. So this, as a new believer, I do want to encourage you, if you are a new believer, you know a new believer, there's a tendency sometimes to run back to the place that you hung around with, the people you hung around with. And there's some wisdom there in not doing that. You should pray for them. You should love them. You should invite them out of that whatever mess they may be into for coffee or whatever, 
but you shouldn't put yourself back into that tempting situation probably for a long time if ever it's it's a it's a, you know you we wind up there are many christians who wind up stumbling themselves again by running back to that situation to share the gospel and they may there may be a heart of i want to share the gospel there and you should but figure out a way to do it outside of a scenario that that brings temptation to you verse 7 but the end of all things is at hand therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers i'm not trying to step on any feet here but i might um remember this was almost 2000 years ago and so it's easy for us to sit here 2000 years later and wonder when is this going to happen when is this going to happen and Peter answers this line of questions in Second Peter. That sco- uh, Second Peter three, uh, three and four. That scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, saying, "Where is the promise of his coming?" For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Second Peter, three eight and nine. But beloved, do not forget this one thing: that the Lord, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand, and a thousand is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God has left his, his church, us, in a state of expectation. And there's a, that is how we should live. We don't know. We know for certain that we're closer than we ever been, we've ever been, right? This, I'm going to put this up. We know for certain that there will be an end to this world as we know it. It is closer now than it has ever been. And we are to be serious and watchful in our prayers. This we know beyond a shadow of a doubt. There's, there's debate out there on, on exactly how things play out at the end. There's, there's a reality. Some people think things will play out this way way. some people think things will play out this way but the things that we know for certain is it's getting close it's getting close we know that we're supposed to be watchful and serious in in prayers so that's the that's the important part about we're reaching the end times one of the major aspects of the approaching end times is that deception will be rampant right there will be massive deception. Even the body of Christ, many of the elect will be deceived. And all of us think, not me, right? So we're, all of us think we're immune to deception. And the reality is none of us are immune to deception. And we need to be aware. That said, as followers of Jesus, the truth, we should be more aware and able to discern truth from deception than any other group of people. We should be if we're watchful and serious, right? Not trying to step on toes. So buckle up, not hurting anybody here. Can we all agree that Hollywood lies? That should be, right? Hollywood lies, right? Can we all agree that the media lies? Fox News, CNN, all of them, they all lie, right? Can we all agree that the government lies? They're not, right? This, all right, good. So we can at least start there. Now we're going to get to my life verse. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who could know it? Right? That's me. My heart is deceitful. Your heart is deceitful. That's us. So not only do all these other things lie, and we know they do, but our heart has a tendency to lie. So we need to be very careful with the I think this. I want this. This is what I believe to be true. There's only one place. There is only one place that we can rely on the truth, and that's God's word. Not what we think, not what so-and-so teacher thinks, not what Joel thinks, not what anybody thinks. And there's, there's people that we can learn to trust that they'll tell the truth, right? There's but that doesn't mean they've told the truth. We can trust that they, ha- they have told what they believe to be the truth, right? And there are people in my life, Denny, 
I know he's going to tell me what he believes to be the truth, no matter what, right? That's good. That doesn't mean it is the truth, and I'm not calling him out here. I'm just saying, but you under, understand what I mean. There, there's people we can learn to trust that they are telling you what they believe is the truth. But that, again, doesn't necessarily mean it is the truth because their heart could be deceived, and they could believe it 100%. That goes for me and everybody. All right, so if somebody, that said, if somebody has a history of lying to you, would you then believe what they have to say? Would you, over and over and over and over, they've lied to us, they've lied to me, would you then, next time they say something else, totally, totally believe you, I'm on board? <laughs> no. no. You'd be like, all right, we'll, we'll see. We, they, they could be telling the truth. But the reality is you're not going to believe them until you've proven that what they've said is true, right? And the same thing should go for Hollywood. Same thing should go for the media, Fox News or CNN. The same thing should go, the same thing should go for uh, the government. They have a history of lying, 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 lying. When they spread a narrative, when they're running with something as truth, that should throw up a flag to us like I don't know what's wrong in that but there's probably something wrong in that right that, that should absolutely throw up that flag if, if the media is running with it we should be mm. if the government's pushing it we should be mm. and so that's all that's to say this brings us to the end times and end times events that we see and I want you guys to be very careful all the major players in what's going on in Israel are evil. All of them. The United States government's evil. The state of Israel is evil. Hamas is evil. Not one of them are good. So we need to be very careful as believers to hook our ship onto, you know, in our tendency, it's we're hooking our ship onto Israel. And, oh, let's go kill all those people. No, no. We need to be very careful with that type of Good and bad, good and bad. They're good, they're bad. No, the reality is all of them are evil. And we need to look up and we need to look in God's word for what's true. We need to pray, we need to seek. And the people that we need to be praying for are the Jewish and Palestinian Christians. We should pray for the peace of Jerusalem, but we need to, our heart should primarily be for the Jewish and Palestinian Christians. And then the other Jews and the other Palestinians that are caught in this mess between rich, powerful people, that has nothing to do with them. They have no control of it. They're just caught in the mess. The geopolitical stuff, look, right? Observe, watch. That's okay. But be careful jumping into the fray of, I'm on this side, I'm on this side. No, there's innocent people dying in the middle on both sides who have nothing to do with any of it. And they need Jesus, right? So that's my heart encouragement to you. We need to be careful not to get caught up in the rhetoric, right? We need to be sober and buried in God's word, serious in prayer, watchful. The only thing we can trust to be true in this world is God's word. The only thing we can trust to be true in this world is God's word. Verse 8. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. So Peter here in the middle of putting on this, this embrace the battle mindset, getting ready to go into suffering that glorifies the king, he kinda, we have this bubble of, of, ta- of how we should live together as one another and treat one another. And I don't think that's a mistake. We're not going to do well if we're, I'm an island unto myself, I don't need nobody. It's important that we're building relationships with each other, right? It is super important that we are loving one another intentionally 
so that we're building bonds. Those bonds are, are strengthened so that when we, when we suffer, whether it's cancer, whether it's some pain, whether it's whatever that suffering is, we're not doing it alone. We aren't anyway because we we're with Christ, but we're the body. We're his hands and feet. We can't do this alone. We need to have those bonds built. And so I'm encouraging you guys, make, if you're not in a home fellowship group, you should be in one. We can't do much of what we're about to talk, talk about if all we're doing is showing up on a Sunday morning. Hi, bye, good to see you. That's hard. It's hard to walk together and build those bonds that are strong and ready for suffering if all we ever see is each other on a Sunday morning. We've got to spend time with each other. We've got a iron sharpening iron. Man, that guy annoys me. That's probably something in you that needs to change. <laughs> right? Not, not that he doesn't have something to change. But the truth of the matter is, is that annoyance you're feeling is something you need to sit down needs to be dealt with in you so you can walk in love with him, all right? So, all right. So the Bible's kind of, you know, the Bible is very clear. Lots of verses on our job to be a light to this world, to be a salt and light, to reach out, to share the gospel. But there are, I'm about to share some verses here this is 10 of dozens of one another verses of, of the relationship that's intended to be. When, we, when, when somebody is drawn to Christ, they become part of this body. That shouldn't be an alone traveling. They shouldn't be alone after that. We should be grabbing each other hand in hand and let's go. Let's do this. How can I, how can I love you? How can I encourage you? How can I bless you? How can I pray with you? We've got to do this together. I encourage you guys, if you aren't actively having people to your house, do it. Look around this room. Who have I not had to my house? Invite them. It doesn't matter if they're your demographic, your age, younger, older, whatever. Invite them to your house. Love on them. Encourage them. We should be looking to constantly build those connections with each other. Mark 90, 50. Salt is good, but if the salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. John 13, 14. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. This is the lowliest task. We're talking about Jesus our Lord, our King, in the lowliest. We're talking in a time frame. People wore slippers and pooped on the road. It was nasty to wash somebody's feet. Jesus did that to the, to the lowest. He took the lowest task to the lowest person and washed his feet. That's what, let's do that for one another. John 13 34 and 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Is what we are inviting people into, to be a part of this body of Christ, is it different than the world? When somebody comes in from outside, do they see a love here? Or do they see kind of cold, standoffish? Or is there a warm love for one another, not a fakeness, not a, eh, it's, but a warm love for one another. That should be, if that's not here, let's work on that with each other. If there's somebody here that you have a, a fresh deal with it, go take care of it. Don't let, because that just spreads. When there's a, when there's a problem there, I don't like this person. Then, like, then there's temptation to gossip. Then there's, I, I avoid them. And now there's a, there's a, you know, people, a get together, but they're going, so I'm not going to go to that get together. And so it, it can just spread to be a massive problem. Deal with it. If there's friction between each other, let's 
Forgive one another. Romans 12.10, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. We should prefer one another as believers. We should, we should prefer one another. You don't think the enemy tries to prevent that. Man, our hearts should be in preference towards each other above anybody else. Romans 14, 13, therefore let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. That's a choice. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see something I'm intentionally doing that's causing them to stumble, or I'm going to choose to not do that. It may, be, it may not be a bad thing. It could be having a glass of wine at your house. I know this brother struggles with this. I'm not going to even, I'm not hiding like uh, being, you know, two-faced, but I'm not going to throw something under his feet that could cause him to stumble. I'm not going to do it. Even if you have freedom to drink personally, you don't do that, right? Name your other thing. If you know a brother stumbles with something, you know, a certain conversation topic throws them off into craziness you don't bring up that conversation topic you don't throw a stumbling block in, into his way whatever that might be Galatians 5 13 for you brethren have been called li- called to liberty only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh but through love serve one another 1 Thessalonians 4 8 therefore comfort one another with these words. Galatians 6 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. First, First Thessalonians 5 11, therefore comfort each other and edify one another, which means to build up just as you are doing. Colossians 3 13, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against a brother, even as Christ forgave you, in that still we were sinners and Christ died for us, right? Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must die. Must do, excuse me, do. Hey, could be. <laughs> and this is just 10. This is 10 verses of literally dozens of do one another. And we can't do that if we're just coming Sunday morning. So I encourage you, get in a home fellowship group. I encourage you, be looking around, figuring out how to make uh, time. Go eat with each other after service. Um, if Eating out's gotten crazy expensive. So if you can't do that, plan next week. Okay, come over to my house. We're going to do something after service. I encourage you guys, let's all do this together. Love covers a multitude of sin. Did I skip a verse? I didn't. Okay, so sorry, guys. Um, end of eight there. It says love covers a multitude of sins. Just a minor. What is covering? This is not covering up, right? This is not somebody's in sin and, you know, they've hurt somebody and, you know, like what Catholic Church has done. You can't. I'm not throwing them a bus. Sorry, Lord. Um, what many people, many organizations have done to not embarrass themselves as an organization, they cover up this sin, protecting the person sinning and not the one sinned against. Not what this is talking about at all. This is the idea of when we walk in grace with one another. So, well, let's, let's go back to Adam and Eve, right? They sinned. God, God killed an animal and made a covering for them. They were naked so that they didn't have to walk around in their nakedness and sin. It was covered, right? At that point, the sin hadn't been totally taken away. That's, o- that's only what, that's what Jesus did on the cross. But God covered their sin, so they didn't have to walk in nakedness and shame. And this is the same thing. Our love for each other should cover, when we know about somebody's sin, that shouldn't be like, you know, let's t- tell everybody about it. Woo, look what they mess up with. Let's go to the prayer chain and, hey, you need to pray for so-and-so. They're in bad sin. 
right? We need to be, our love covers a multitude of sins so they don't have to walk in shame and nakedness around here so we can all walk together and not have our sins just for everybody to see, right? They're there. We shouldn't, we individually You should be careful, let me put it this way. We should confess our sins to somebody. Somebody. Somebody should know the sins that you're struggling with. But that's not necessarily, whoop. Right, everybody. Hey, and post on Facebook, I did this thing. Right, so that's not, that's not, somebody should know your sin. But if you know somebody else's sin, that should be covered. You understand what I'm saying? You should not be, spreading that sin anywhere else. It's recovered. Love covers a multitude of sins. All right. Verse 9. Sorry, guys. Running out of time here. Verse 9. Um, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. The idea here is, let's like we're talking about, just spend time with each other. Be open to having people over. And just be okay with it. Just be okay with it. Yeah, your house is going to be a mess sometimes. Yeah, you're going to move the laundry pile into here, and the next day you're going to move the laundry pile back to there. That doesn't happen at our house. But at your house, that might happen. <laughs> I'm, getting a, I'm getting the stink eye from Orna right now. <laughs> right? So... There's nobody house that's perfect, right? But that's not, people, when, when, when there's a, a love connection that needs to happen there, it doesn't matter. It, your time matters. Your presence matters. Being together matters. Breaking bread matters. Not, your house is a little messy. Not that you shouldn't clean your house. But that's not the, that's not the more important thing. Sometimes you sacrifice and say, the more important thing is that we make these connections, right? Okay. Being the body of Christ is not a Sunday-only thing. Being the body of Christ is not a Sunday-only thing. All right. Verse 10, 11. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Christ Jesus, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Ephesians 4, 11 through 12, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Oops. Yeah, sorry. We are all called to ministry for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And we know this. I know that you know this. We're all called to ministry here, though. The pastors and elders, they're not, they're not the ones called to ministry we're all called to ministry here. Every one of us are called to pour out our lives to serve each other and the reach lost. Every single one of us. We're here to try to help teach. We're here to try, try to encourage, try to build up. We're all, you know, God's, and so, so this reminds me of something Pastor Jim tells, tells us all the time is that everybody has the Holy Spirit. That's not exclusive. I, we don't have the market cornered on that, Right? That's each and every one of us has giftings and callings and abilities and name whatever it is, talents to use for the kingdom. Are you using them? I'm not saying just in here. It doesn't have to be here necessarily. It sh there should be some of that here. We should be ministering one to another. This body needs your gifts, period. God brought this body together with a certain mixing and smattering of gifts among, among us, that if, that if one of you is not using a gift, we're hurting as a body because that gift is not being used here. 
But you can use your, your gifts in many places with many other believers, with many those that aren't. But we're all called to this ministry. 1 Corinthians 10.31, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. If you are a Christian, you have gifts that will be used to minister to the body for the glory of God. Are you using them? If not, why not? What is stopping you? And that's an honest question. That's not rhetorical. If you're not, why aren't you? There's, I, I can pull out dozens of excuses that would work for me. I don't have time. I got this other thing to do. I'm busy. I got four kids. I've got, there's lots of reasons I can pull out excuses. And I'm not exalting myself. I make lots of excuses. I'm just encouraging you. Are, are they excuses? The reasons you're not? Are they, or are you walking in them? And I'm not saying, you. I'm, if you are serving, if you are pouring out your gifts, this isn't a, darn you, do it more. It's just a, if you're not, why not? If you're not, why not? Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened. <laughs> this will be a strange analogy. Is my son in here? He's not in here. Um, so I have a, anywhere this part of my head is a strange button that if I hit it, I lose my mind in murderous rage. So <laughs> it's, it's uh, it, I, I guess that was about 13, I guess. Anyway, we were outside doing something in the yard, and I'm walking, looking down at the grass, and I walk into a, a tree, a limb, right? And I'm doing Chris Farley. <laughs> bleep, 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 bleep. Zev looks, he's like, <laughs> who are you? And what did you do with my father? Right, out of most unsanctified part of who I am comes out when I hit my head. I'm not saying, you know, this is. So once I gain my composure, here he is looking at me like, you are crazy. What's wrong with you? And the, the reality, that, though, and, I, and it's a weird a weird analogy, but the reality is it wasn't that painful. I wasn't expecting it. Right? My mind wasn't set to be hit in the head right there with the pokey stick. and <laughs> Right? I was not thinking about having that right now. And so I had this major reaction to, to what happened. Right? An overreaction to what happened. And, that's, and this, this is what, Paul, what Peter's trying to protect us from. It's not strange when bad things happen to believers. We live in a fallen world. Bad things happen, period, that aren't necessarily sanctified suffering, right? We just live in a fallen world and we make poor choices that sometimes result in suffering. But we need to, be, we need to have the mindset that suffering is going to happen and we shouldn't be shocked when it happens. I'm not saying that's easy. I'm not saying that, that to take away any of the pain but, but it can help reduce the pain when we have our mindset right. I'm not saying reduce the pain. But it can help us bear the, bear the suffering in a way that glorifies our Father when we have our mindset and expectation this could happen. This could happen. Doesn't mean it's going to happen all the time. Some of us are, are suffering right now. Some of us aren't. In truth, I had a very hard time with this, with this scripture. And I don't want to portray that I, I've, I haven't had a lot of suffering in my life. But I, so I can't say from personal experience, this is, what, this is what you do. But I know from obeying scripture in other areas, it's trustworthy. And this is what the Bible says. And so I can trust, even though I haven't personally walked that road yet, I can look at you and I can say, I know this is the way to do it because God's word is true. Amen?
God's word is true. We can trust that this is the way to do it. And so Peter's telling us, set your mind. That's the first thing. Before you get there, set your mind. This is expected. This is expected. Praise the Lord. If I have a day that I'm not suffering, if I have a week, if I have a year that I didn't suffer, praise God. But it's expected. Ephesians 6, and I'm not going to read it, I'm not going to go through that, gives us that preparation, what, what the things we need to do to, to prepare our body and our minds spiritually, right? Verse 13. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when, he, when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Take joy, but rejoice. His glory is revealed when we stand strong in him through fiery trials. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. The same event, the same happening, God is glorified and God is blasphemed. There's a key, uh, an important thing I'm going to point out here is that what, what matters for God's glorification in our life is not the event, it's our response to it. Not, not right? It's how do we respond in that event. Okay, and I'm going to go back to last week a little bit to kind of take, take away from last week. So, give you a kind of example of how we should live in this. If we all, because if you're married, there's battles there, right? There's struggle there. It's not the same as suffering, but this is just to kind of give you a, it can be the same as suffering, but this, <laughs> this is not in my life. <laughs> Whew, that was close. <laughs> I'm off the couch. Um, but um, lost my train of thought. Oh, yeah, why? So it's not the same as suffering, but it'll give you a picture of what I'm talking about here. So, so wives, likewise, be submissive to your husbands. And the men think, yeah, go make me a sandwich, right? And so this, this is, it, it's not to take any weight of the requirement from the women, but men, when we come across Scripture like this, it's how, how am I throwing a stumbling block in my wife's path to the obedience of this? Am I throwing a stumbling block? Am I making it hard for her to submit to me because I'm a jerk, because I'm not a very good leader, because, and that doesn't take away, he says submit. That doesn't take that away. But what are you doing, men, that's making that difficult? The other side, husbands, love your wives like Christ loves the church. Yeah, well, when he loves me like that, I'll do my part, right? <laughs> Again, this is not to take the weight away from the men. But ladies, what are you doing that's causing a stumbling block to him loving you like that? That's, that's what you should, our reaction in any situation, in any circumstance, in any relation, that's what God is looking for. How do I apply this to me, not how do I apply things to you, right? That's, that's what we do with Scripture. That's what matters in, a, in an event where there's, there's persecution. God, God looks on my heart. He looks on what I'm doing. He looks on how I'm reacting. And we need to read Scripture that way, and we need to understand events that way, Orna's having a bad day and you know, did, did whatever. And, but what did I do to help her or harm her in that, right? She's never had a bad day, but, you know, <laughs> theoretically. What, if, what do I do to help her or, or trip her up and cause a stumbling block in her path, right? And so the same thing here. This is going back to suffering is, is it's, how do I react in that suffering? Don't worry about the other, what other people say about it. Don't worry about it, any of that. This is glorifying God is a you and him situation. When you're in suffering, it only matters what's going on here, right? Don't let anybody else heap anything else onto you. 
with that. It's between you and him. How do, how do I, do I relate to God and, and sing praises to him in this thing that I'd rather be dead. I'd rather not be here. I'd rather not suffer this. No. God, I want to worship you in this, right? The same event, the same situation, circumstance, God can be glorified and blasphemed at the same time, right? God does not call us to control events or people. He calls us to glorify him in the midst of the trials. God does not call us to control events or people. He calls us to glorify him in the midst of trials. All right, verse 15. I'm land this plane. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's business. It's weird to put busybody in that list, right? I totally support it. Um, I'm just kidding. So I, I think what that list is, is that's intended to be a span, right? It tended to be murder, really bad. Thief, pretty bad. Not as bad as rape. Not as bad as molesting kids. Not as, you know, it's murder, rape, you know, busybody. That's not a good thing either, right? But it's meant to be a span. Any of these things that we do to cause self-induced suffering... There's no glory in that, right? We cause our own problem. I get diabetes because I won't stop eating sugar. Oh, man, I'm suffering for Jesus. No, it's my own stupid fault. I wouldn't stop eating sugar, right? And so we have to be, we have to be careful in our victim culture where there's social credit for victimhood. Like you get a pat on your back if you're a victim. The more victim you are, you know, and, and people then start causing themselves all sorts of suffering. So they get lots of credit, you know, lots of affirmation, lots of I'm sorry's on Facebook, lots of oh, we need to be careful as believers to separate the suffering that we've caused ourselves from the suffering that, that was not caused by us. Now, this suffering we caused ourselves can be redeemed when we repent. Right? We may still suffer that for the rest of our life. Whatever health issue we caused, whatever that is, broken marriage, whatever that is that we may have caused ourselves, we may suffer that for the rest. But we can redeem that suffering when we repent, repent and no longer pretend we weren't the instigator of it. Right? But this, so this, this is what this verse is about is, is don't. You know, these things that we cause to ourselves, this suffering we put ourselves through, there's no glory in that. There's no inherent glory in suffering. Is that God, God doesn't want us to suffer. He doesn't enjoy our pain. There's no inherent goodness to suffering. It's only what we do in the suffering that matters. Sixteen, okay. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God in this matter. We have no need for shame. Though the world will try to shame us, though they will talk poorly of us, they will look, at us, look down at us, we have no reason to be ashamed. We're not here to get glory from this world. We're here to glorify our King. There's no need to be ashamed. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God Commit their souls to him in doing good as a faithful creator. Right, can you play that video? When we suffer in this lifetime, we need to keep a few things in perspective. Number one, Romans 8:28. God works all things together for good 
for those who love him and for those who are called according to his purpose. God works all things, even the worst things, together for good for his people. We need to keep that in focus. And if we're unable to see that, if we're so struggling with our difficulties that we we can't possibly see or think or imagine the good that can come from it, then we need to keep this in perspective. That the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory we shall see. As difficult as it gets in this lifetime, we have the promise and the hope of eternal life with Christ. And the worst horrors that we can imagine in this life are not even worthy to be compared with how wonderful it will be to be with Christ. Not worthy to be compared. And we cling to these things, and I'm clinging to these things right now, that God is going to work good in this lifetime. And that these things someday shall pass, and they won't even be worthy of mentioning in light of seeing Jesus, I believe it. And then we bring those things together with this truth, the promise of a new heaven and a new earth. That time where Christ himself will set right every wrong and he'll be with us in the boat of pain in the storm. As it says in Revelation 21, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is among men and he will dwell among them and they shall be his people and God himself will be among them and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain for the first things had passed away. That day is coming. You see, the, God has never promised us that we won't suffer in this lifetime. In fact, he's made it explicit in the word of God that we will suffer in this lifetime. But there is coming a day in the renewal of all things, in the fullness of Christ's presence, where because of his person, because of his presence, there will be no more tears. He himself will wipe them away. No more crying, mourning, pain, no more cancer, no more death. I have joy in the pain because I will gain in a new way the presence of Jesus himself. And then holding on to these things when we all suffer in life will allow us to be the kind of person that Job was. In Job chapter 1, he got horrible news after horrible news after horrible news. His entire family, all of his kids were wiped out. All of his belongings, all of his wealth was all wiped out in a day. And it says... Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground. That's how they mourned then. But look what he did. And worshiped. That's the man that I want to be. I want to be the kind of man that the more I lose, the more I worship God. Because the more I lose in this world, the more of a treasure he becomes to me in this moment. And Job said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And my daily prayer is verse 22. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. the kind of people we need to be in suffering. Shall we indeed take the good and not adversity? Has God not warned us that in this world we would have difficulty? But take heart, he has overcome the world and there is coming a new day. 
And I want to tell you, church, that Jesus is more present in our brokenness. The gospel is more real and on greater display when we are broken than at any other time. Ask the worship team, the musicians to come up, please. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as a faithful creator. That word commit is a transactional word, Luke 23, 46. And then Jesus, and when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. That, that word is a, back in that culture, if I, if I took something of value, very valuable to me, and I gave it to somebody to hold for me, it was on their honor that they would hold that. They, I was trusting them with something valuable to me that they, it, I was committing that to them. That's the word used there. And I'm expecting to get it back in full. Right? And that's the use. So the, the point being here is that you can commit all of this up unto the Father, right? Uh, who's a faithful creator. Those are suffering. You can commit that suffering that you're going through, and I'm not making any light of it. It's, it's, it's real. I'm sorry you're going through it. And it could be emotional, it could be physical, it could be self-induced, but that doesn't mean it's not, not real. And you, you can turn that suffering to be glorifying to God if you'd repent and just commit all of it to Him. Lord, this, this is difficult to go through. Can you hold my, <laughs> I'm committing my soul to you that Lord, will you sustain me through this? So if you're suffering, I'm going to encourage you to come down here and we're going to have the elders come. We're going to have them pray. If you don't feel comfortable coming down, let us know afterwards and we'll gladly anoint you and pray as well. But I want to, if there's any in here who don't know Christ, We don't get a promise of posies and unicorns. It's just not the promise we get, right? There will be suffering. There is a, there is a cost to count. But there's an eternity that's worth it. This life, you'll, you'll suffer without Christ or with Christ in this life. You will. But if you suffer with Christ in this life, there's an eternity without it. So that's what's on offer to you. If you don't know Christ, if you haven't put your faith in him, I encourage you to do that. Come forward. Round the earth is quaked before. Moved by the sound of his voice. Seas that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken for my God. And through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through
it as well is not we don't always feel that that's that choice setting our mind and let God do the work of the heart what is wrong with me <laughs> sorry guys <clears throat> If you haven't put your faith in Christ, I'd encourage you to pray with me. There's, this is not a prayer of magical words. It's, it's what I encourage you to pray w- with your heart in honesty and openness and humility to God. Something like this. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Christ to die for me. Thank you for sending Jesus to pay the penalty for my sin. Help me to see my sin for what it is, an offense to you. Help me to turn and reject it. And help me to run to you. 
every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys. Thank you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys.